uh, bless us, Lord, as, as we seek to follow you and do these things. And, and we give it all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, amen. Luke chapter 2, and look with me at verse 7. Because, you know, for this in, incredible event that we have happening here, this, you know, it, it's just awesome to me as we picture it and we see all the movies and we watch all the things. But this, just this little thing, man. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. In the end. And as you and I come together right now to examine the birth of Christ, I really hope you listen today. I really hope you hear. Um, for some of you, it, it may be the first time really hearing this because if even for a moment this is true, you know, and, and some people think that it isn't. Some people think that it's a myth, that it's a fairy tale almost. But if it's true, then it's the most important thing you could hear in your life because it makes a difference in eternity. This right here was planned before the beginning of time. And Jesus came not as, as this great you know, ruler. He didn't come looking super cool and with lights and smoke and, you know, and somebody playing the electric guitar when he walked on stage. There was none of that. He was born so poor that literally when they went to go and make the sacrifice for him, his parents brought two birds that were worth about a penny apiece. Because that's all they could afford. And our Savior, our King, the Lord of the universe, was born into this. He was approachable. He was touchable. He was accessible to you and me. Now, we started out in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, but I'm going to take a jump real quick and jump with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. Because this is necessary. This is what is true. Okay, not going to the preface. We're going to Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you can get past that one, then you've, you've achieved much in this life. If you can really look at that and you can say, okay, this is true, this is real, this is what it is. You know, I, I can come to acknowledge and know that if this is true, then everything else that he says can be true as well. Many people come into this and they come with these objections in their minds because they begin to question and wonder, well, how could there have been a star that they could have followed to somebody's house, you know? Uh, you know, to, to 212 Bethlehem Lane or wherever it was. You know, how could, how could that happen? How could this happen? How could a virgin give birth? Can we turn the air conditioning on? I see a number of people fanning. Um, everybody's wearing their nice clothes today, so, you know. Uh, you know, but, but a lot of people, you know, we come into this and, and you know, and I'm not going to sit there and do a big argument about creationism or evolution or any of those things or, or trying to find out what evidence there is for what because, you know, it's funny how every, uh, you know, every year they find a missing link and they broadcast that, you know, big news everywhere. But when they confess that they really didn't find it, that's usually on page 8 instead of page 1 like it was two weeks ago. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I'm not going to sit there and fight about those things because if we can believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, if I can come to that acceptance of fact, then everything else becomes possible because for someone to literally speak time, creation, and everything itself into existence, if I can accept that, I can accept anything. Because that person, by his very nature, would be able to act outside of what we might think of as natural law. A virgin can't give birth. Well, if the person that could create a son by going boo said, have a baby, you're going to have a baby, right? So it, it, it gets to where I can accept everything. And as we come into this and we look at creation, in Genesis 131, look at it with me if you would. In Genesis 131, 
God, when he created all these things, when he did all these things, it looks and he says, God saw everything that he made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So this creator that, that, you know, we, we don't even know his name at this time. We don't even know who he is. We know that he is God. And out from his literal breath, not only does he create everything, he creates you and I. In, in Genesis one twenty seven, so skip back just a little bit, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And not just that, but, you know, it, it, it becomes even better because what happens? Look at, at chapter 2, verse 7 with me, if you would. God makes this person from dirt, from dirt, forms this person from the earth. What did he look like? What, what was he formed? You know, was he, was he like this perfect, you know, most of us think of the statue of David when we think of something like that. You know, is this what God did? And then he, it says in verse 7 of chapter 2, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So, it, and it, you know, was it the force of God doing this? Was it this creation happening? We don't know. But what we do know is that the very life of God, his breath, was in man. Was in him. That was his life. Oh. And then what does God do? He plants a garden just for Adam and Eve. Just for them. Because he loved them so much. He planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we come here and we see, man, that everything was as close to perfection as we could get. And we talked about this when we went through Genesis with each other, you know, uh, and for most of us, we would go, why, if you designed a perfect system, would you design you know, for failure to be in there? Why would you design a system? Why would an architect design a system that would have failure in it? Because to have a perfect system as it is with beings like you and I, who are somewhat autonomous and we can do things, we have to have free will. You and I have to have free will, and in that free will have the ability to make imperfect choices. And what did Adam and Eve do? Hmm? Yeah, they sinned, man. Because it's funny, in, in chapter 2, verses 15, it says, The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden, to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Think about that for a second. Man, these guys don't even know what good and evil is. They have absolutely no concept of it. You and I do. But they didn't. They have no concept of it. They have no commands. They have no law. They have no rules. They have no, you know, don't touch it, don't touch it. They have one. They have one. And he says, don't eat of this fruit because the day the very moment you eat of it you will surely die and we go from this this idea of a world that is perfect and good this creation that is unblemished by sin unblemished by fallenness unblemished by imperfection and then we got into it and guess what we did all right it's that whole saying, that old saying that we know of, uh, if you ever find a perfect church, join, don't join it because then it won't be perfect anymore, right? Spurgeon actually said that. He said, you know, we, we sit there and we, you know, we should be happy that no churches are perfect because if they were, they would never let us in, right? <laughs> but see, you know, we come into this, the Bible refers to this world as a fallen world. If you went to Genesis chapter 3, you know, the whole chapter, man, we see it as the temptation and the fall of man. This cunning enemy comes in. 
and he misrepresents God right off the bat. That's the first thing that he does. And a lot of times that's when we tend to fall into sin too because we will let him misrepresent God or we will misrepresent God and say, but I think God wants me to be happy. God wants me to have this or God wants me to have that. When God has kind of made it clear how he stands on a lot of things. And here all he has said, he hasn't said, you know, hey, you need to, you know, worship every Sunday. You need to do this. You need to do that. He says one thing, man. Don't eat the fruit. Don't eat it, Josh. Stop it. Right? But what does Josh do? He goes and he eats the fruit, right? And and there's a key thing as you look and you see what the what Satan says. We know him to be Satan now, the enemy. Um, and it was Adam, not Josh, just in case you guys, so you don't blame him later. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> right on. You see, that's that's where we're going with that, too. Josh is innocent. That's right. It's the woman's fault. That's what, I, that's what I'm always saying, ain't it, love? Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, I mean, there's so many theological discussions we could get into about what Satan is doing here and why he is doing it. But he definitely misrepresents God because he speaks of this dying as simply a physical act. Eve has already misrepresented God because she said, don't even touch it because if you just touch it, you'll die. They've added on to what God had said because God just said, don't eat it. And so when the enemy says, no, 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 go ahead, touch it. And you touch it and you don't die. And then she eats it. And what she doesn't understand that in that disobedience and eating it, she dies spiritually. It is an immediate spiritual death. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And it is not death to come, but it is death right now. And Satan, he tells him, you'll know what you're supposed to do. You can't be good if you don't know what good and evil are, right? He says, you've got to know both. God didn't say that. The enemy says that. And for many of us, we think that, well, without evil, there can be no good. I'm just here to show you how good you really are, right? That's not how God designed this. The evil of mankind is here because mankind chooses to do evil. Most of us sit there and we think, well, as long as we know to do good, as long as we know to do good, but without, you know, you, you can't define good as it is without also knowing, knowing evil. Not just knowing about evil, but knowing evil. Because at this moment, before she takes the bite of that apple or, or that pear or that yucca plant or whatever it was she partook of, we don't know, or a fig, we have no idea what it was. But before she takes a bite of it, they don't know good. They don't know evil. They just know God. And they have fellowship with him. It says when he comes into the garden later, they know the sound of what it sounds like when he comes in. They hear him come in and they go, ooh, God's here. That's how familiar they were with him. And that's all they, they just know God. But sin enters in. And when God questions them in, in verses 11 through 13, Adam blames Eve, right? And who does Eve blame? The serpent, right? We're always blaming somebody else for our behavior, for the things that we do, the choices that we make. It's always somebody else's fault, not mine. But when God hands out the curses in Genesis chapter 3, He hands them out to everybody, beginning with the serpent. And in the curse of the serpent, we also see the promise of deliverance. Genesis chapter 3, if you would, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And this is He's talking to the serpent. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. So in this very statement right here, and, we're gonna, and we see later that Adam and Eve actually believe that this is talking about a son that will be born to them. You know? 
Because that is that seed that is promised. And notice this is one of the things that Paul notices and, and he remarks on later and he remarks on when God talks to Abraham because the seed is singular. It's not plural. It's not talking about somebody down the line. It's talking about a, spe- a specific, particular person that will be born to you. And it, the, it is the male pronoun. So it is the he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. It will be a boy. Okay? He's very specific here. And then the curse has come. Adam and Eve is kicked out of Eden. They're banished because the life of God is no longer in them and they can no longer dwell where he is. You and I, we, you know, everybody kind of thinks in this planet that they're children of God, but we're not. We got kicked out, y'all. Okay? We're on the outside looking in. We're not all children of God. We're not. The Bible specifically says that we're children of wrath. That we are sons of the devil. And that we walk with him. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, if you look at that with me real quick, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Boom. She's like, okay, this is it. All right. The seed has arrived. If you were to look at that in Hebrew, most scholars point out that it. she literally says, I have acquired the man from the Lord. So I have gotten a man from the Lord. They even name him, get it, right? Or gotten. Or acquired. His name is Cain. And here they think this, this seed is born. Oh, man. This is the one that's going to get us back into the garden. This is it. This is it. And then he kills his brother and blows everything. It's like, man, wouldn't that be a bummer? Wouldn't that, that would just, I mean, you know, the promise, uh, how'd he feel about himself, too, after that, you know? Everybody's hopes riding on him. He's the the football hero. He's the quarterback. Everybody's like, you're going to win it for us. And then he blows it totally. And they're sitting there, man, and they're, they're standing. And this is the, the crazy thing to me that you and I kind of miss sometimes, is they are literally standing at the gates, and there's two angels with swords, and there's the garden. I mean, it's, I mean, they could spit on it, you know what I'm saying? And they, But they can't go in. They can't go in. And here they thought, he's our ticket. But he wasn't. But God had a plan the bible tells us that in this fallenness in this thing that we have experienced it tells us that this wickedness is not just in adam and eve it is in you and i you know we sit there and think well if adam just you know if if i could have been there everything be better right but it's not it's not true it's not right Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The problem with the world is that it's following its heart. Right? Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 31 says, You know, God gave them up to, a, you know, people that will not acknowledge God. God will give them up to a debased mind to do what ought not, ought not to be done. Because we or they are foolish. We were. That was you and I before we came to know him. Matthew fifteen nineteen, Jesus said, Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. That's what comes out of our hearts, he says. He, he backs it up in, in Mark 7, 21 through 23. And if people, we know when we sit there and we think that that we're really okay and that mankind is basically good, Proverbs twenty eight twenty six. you know, mankind says, follow your heart. Do, you know, uh, what is it that, that the, the grasshopper sings when you wish upon a star, right? If you just follow your heart, it's a cricket. Yeah, not the grasshopper, the cricket, right? You can tell I haven't had kids for a long time, you know. The grandkids haven't started watching the movies yet. You know, my cultural reference kind of bomb there um but thanks for knowing the infantile reference (laughs) 
There's always one. So Rather's Cricket saying, follow your heart. You know, follow your heart and, and all these things will happen. But, but Proverbs 28, 26 says, whoever trusts in his own heart is a fool. Guys, we, have, we, are, we were fallen. And if you think you can do it on your own, if you think you can be good enough to enter into heaven, if you think you've got control of your life, you're seriously misled. So is it any wonder that in this broken world that we live in, we go in so many different directions? We go in so many different areas, and we try and do so many different things. And, you know, I try to be good. I, I, I go and I be bad, and, I, and then I try to be in the middle, and, and I'm trying all these things. And then I begin, as I grow older, or as I begin to destroy my life with the choices that I make, and I see people worship themselves. I see people worship their cars, their boats, their homes, their families. I see people, you know, I, I, I see wives who worship their husbands. I, you know, I, I see, no, well, not a lot. No, I hear you laughing. Um, <laughs> I see husbands who literally worship their wives. I see wives worship their children. I see husbands worship their children. And, and, I, and I see so many people try to do so many good things. We all did. We all do. And, and, and we're trying to be good and we're trying to do it. And God says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't care what you do. I do not care. It, you know, it, it, again, it's not like I don't care that people are bad or good. We, you know, it, it is better that people be good simply for society, simply for us to function you know, in a civil manner. But good does not earn us a place in heaven because we're broken and we cannot do it on our own. So what do we do? Well, in honor of Star Wars, I would like to quote... The words of the original Captain Kirk, I've got a plan, right? I know, I know, Kirk is Star Trek, I know, I know. I'm, huh? What's the difference? Nice. We're, somebody's trying to start a fist fight in the audience, but we're going to let that one go. <laughs> and it's not me that has a plan, it's God that has a plan, and he actually began to affect it before the world began. Before time even came into existence, they began to plan our salvation, not in us, not in you, but in Christ, in Jesus Christ himself. And where Adam broke it, God fixes it in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, It is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who's the last Adam? Jesus. That's right. It's Jesus. Romans 5.14 that says that, that Adam is a type of him who was to come, which is Jesus. Romans 5.17 says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, thanks Adam, right? Much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteous will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. And notice what it says here. The righteousness will reign in life. The key in all this is that life that we lost in the garden. What, is, what has Christ done with the cross? The blood of Jesus Christ pays for the sins of all mankind. Okay, you and I know that. Sometimes we know it to the point of, of well, I'll get into that in a moment. Look with, with me if you would. So now let's turn again to John. Look at John. Most of you don't even need to turn because it's like the one verse that most of Christianity and the sports world has memorized, right? John 3.16. Right? So if you just watch football, you'll know this verse. <laughs> Praise God. That's right. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. The world, all of his creation, every person, 
every 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 man every woman every 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 slave every free man you know it, whether you're a king or whether you're a pauper it doesn't matter you god so loved the world and it is it is all inclusive some people will try to say this only applies to those you know who are the elect of god some people will say it is only those who believe he doesn't say that here he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, here's where it gets specific, right? Because it says he gave his greatest gift for us, which was his son. And his son came to die in our place, right? And it says, whoever, whoever, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you think you're elect or whether you wonder if you are, if you choose him, if you choose Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you seek him, you'll find him. If you believe, you'll have it. And you'll have, what does he say? Lasting life. See, that's that life of God that he initially breathed into Adam. So if you, if you wonder, if you wonder, am I really a believer? Am I really saved? Have you experienced that life breathed into you? Have you experienced the Holy Spirit? If you have not, then I would pray that you would seek him out. And ask God to confirm that in you, to to put that in you. We'll, we'll lay hands on you after and, and ask him to fill you with his spirit. Because if you are not filled with his spirit, you cannot live this Christian life. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it is in the present tense, which means right now. You'll have everlasting life at this very moment. Because when did Adam come to life? When God breathed in to him. And a note on the word believe. For most of us, we think that belief is an act of intellectual acknowledgement. If I just acknowledge it intellectually, I can say I believe and I'm okay. But it's not a contract that we're making with God. Biblically, belief, and, and, and we're told later, it's from your heart. It's from your heart. Belief makes up your body, your soul, and your spirit. James spoke of belief, equating it with faith. To believe, as we see in the scriptures, is to tr- the, the word itself means to trust in, to rely on, and to lean on. In James chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, he said, Someone will say, you have faith, I have works. <laughs> we see that argument a lot today, don't we? Here's what James says to many of us. He says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And he says, hey, you believe there's one God? All right, good for you. He says, even the demons believe and tremble. Demons, do you get that? Do you get that? Because some of us think that we can just believe in Jesus Christ and we're okay. Hey, I believed. I'm good. I'm going to do whatever now. He doesn't say that. James says your belief will change the way you live. Verse 20, James says, do you, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? If you're, and, and this is all about life. If you really believe in something wholeheartedly, it changes the way you act. It really does. If I believe, you know, if I really believe if I walk out that door, somebody's going to shoot me in the head, I'm walking out the other door. You know what I'm saying? I know that's extreme. It's like, why why you got to bring shooting into it? But then, you know, I like guns, so there you go. But but it becomes an idea. And an idea springs in something from the heart as to trust in. When I sit down in the chair, I trust it. I trust that it's going to support me. I trust that it's going to hold me. And I sit in the chair. I know there are some chairs I do not trust, right? (laughs) Especially those flimsy plastic ones. I've arrived now to where I don't sit in those anymore. (laughs) But do I trust it enough to put my weight upon it, to lean upon it, to rely on it, to hold me up? And that's the same thing with Jesus. Do I really believe that Jesus died for my sins, and that he rose again from the dead? Do I trust him enough to save me from myself? And will I rely on what he did instead of trying to save my 
self. We're not called to feel sorry. We're called to repent. The word repent does not mean just feeling bad. It means to turn around from what you were doing and go the other way. We've talked about this before. To repent means to do a 180. If I'm walking this way, I'm now walking this way. That's repenting in its basic form. For a lot of us, it becomes a thing where we begin to treat sin as some kind of trivial thing because we say, well, Jesus covered it, so I'm just going to go ahead and sin and I'll, I'll, I'll say I'm sorry later, right? God does not call us to live like that. Sin should not be trivial to us because we know how much it costs. We know how much it costs. And when we, when we love someone that is in sin and doesn't know Christ, that's where we can show them and we know, we know the price that was paid for them. And we want to tell them about it. Because, that, you know, we live in a broken world. A broken world that is a slave to its sins and its passions. But Jesus Christ has set us free and called us to turn from this. That's a choice that many people don't make. They'll believe in God. They'll accept Him. They'll even say, I believe He rose again from the dead. But I'm not going to repent. I'm not doing that. Jesus was telling His disciples in Luke 24, 46-48, he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. He didn't just die. He suffered. He suffered. He took your sin upon himself. And he rose again on the third day. And he said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Repentance. Repentance. Repentance and remission of sins, man. Turn away from what you have been delivered from, he says. Turn away from it. His arms are open. God invites you to come to Him. It's not about you just saying, I'm not going to sin anymore. It's choosing Him. It's turning from sin and death to life. That's all it is. It's not about you being, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the name of the movie where the girl is always happy and always Pollyanna. It's not about you being a Pollyanna. If you don't know the movie, you, you should watch it. You know, I didn't say you were a Pollyanna. She's pretty close, though. Well, not with you. She's not a Pollyanna with you, but with everybody else, she's a Pollyanna. <laughs> New nickname. All right. But, you know, that's the thing is in following him, it's in turning to him. It's not about us being some perfect example of who he is. But we're supposed to reflect him. We're supposed to look like him. We're supposed to be little Christ to the people in this world. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, so that's saying what you believe, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, it's amazing to me to say, for somebody to say, I believe this when their life doesn't match up. Because he says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. It's that heart check, man. It's that heart, that dedication to God that makes you righteous. It's not how you live, how you walk, how you behave. But, he says... With the heart, one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. Your mouth is saying what's happening on the inside. It doesn't guarantee you anything on the outside. The two are tied together, though. This outward confession for us to know. When I hear you say it, I, I want to see your heart, man. I want to see it. I want to be like James and say, does your life match up with what you're saying? We want to see that in each other. And we can only do it by the Holy Spirit. I can't do it in my flesh. I mess up. I'm bad. But He, oh, He, He lives in you, He said. And this is what so many are missing because we have this religious affection for God. Oh, God is so good. Oh, I see what He did. Oh, I, I see it all. 
but do it. Have you repented of your sins and turned away from them? Have you turned to Him and experienced the Holy Spirit? In John 14, 15 through 17, this is what He told His disciples. And He tells you and I. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you will know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. That's His life coming back to live in us. That's eternity. Because the moment He comes to live in you, you begin to live in eternity at that very moment. You'll never die. Never truly. The shell, that'll be gone for a little bit. You know? It'll be done. But oh, Robert ain't dying. I guarantee you that. And all that, all that from this one verse. Luke chapter 2, verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Wow. All that plan, all that doing, all that wrapped up in him coming to die for you and I. Do I know exactly why? Can I explain to every little infinitesimal detail of why it had to happen in this way? No. No one really can. They think they can. And they spend their whole lives trying to. I just know He did it. And I know that I've met Him. And if you would accept Him today, if you would truly trust in, lean on, and rely on Him, you'll be saved. We read John 3.16, but often stop there. We don't go all the way to verse 18, which says, He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, I don't seek to condemn anybody. Neither did Jesus. He said, I didn't come to condemn anyone. I came to save. You have to understand... We already were condemned the moment we were born. The way out is right here. If you'll lean on Him, if you'll trust in Him, if you'll rely on Him, He'll save you. He already has. You just need to have that life from living here. Stand with me if you would and let's pray. Don't be fooled. Messages will not be this short one. We you know that. Uh, it's a Christmas present. That's right. But that's one of the things as we come into this is you know, all the gifts that we're going to be getting and all the things that we're going to be looking at and all of, you know, you name it. Yeah. You and I have the greatest gift of all. We have the greatest gift in Jesus Christ. And if we would just look to Him, if we would just lean upon Him and rely on Him, then you and I can live and share and be who He has called us to be where we are at. And when we blow it, when we make a mistake, we don't trivialize it. We look at it for what it is. It was sin. And we need to turn from it and turn to Him. And when we do, oh, what a beautiful, beautiful time. And you can fellowship with your God. He loves you. You're accepted in the Beloved. He loves you. Repentance is to turn from our sin and to turn to Him and to walk in Him. Let's pray. Father, I lift each and every person here up to You, Lord, and I thank You for what You have done and what You are doing in their lives and in our lives together and our lives with each other. And I pray, Lord, as You move, that You, you do things in them, Lord, that that only Your Holy Spirit can do. That, Father, You would work in them. I pray, Lord, that there are men and women in here. There are men in here, Lord, who want to be filled with Your Holy Spirit. And I pray that You would fill them, Lord. I pray that You would fill them. Lord God, fill them with the Holy Spirit. 
If there is someone in here right now who has given their lives to you, but has not repented and not turned away from their sin, I pray they would repent right now. And in that repentance, and knowing that their sins have been completely covered, that they would walk in that newness of life and be filled with your Holy Spirit, your life in them, right now, Lord. Jesus, you have taken sin out of the equation. We do not have to bring our sins before you. They are taken care of on the cross. You are looking to see if we are alive. Do we have that life living in us? And I pray, Lord, that each and every person here would be filled. Father, we pray for those in here, Lord, as, as we come and looking at the gifts that we get for Christmas, the gift we have gotten of Jesus Christ, the most perfect gift, the one that is eternal. I pray, Lord, that you would show your gifts to the people here, those that are filled with your Holy Spirit, that you would show them the gift that you have for them, how they would use it in the body, how they would know, Lord, how they would be so filled with the Spirit that they could minister to this body. Lord God, fill us with Your Spirit. Lord God, heal those who are hurting. Jesus, we thank You. We praise You. You are our God. And You have given everything for us. thank you. We praise you. And we humble ourselves before you. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be people of repentance. Help us to turn from our sins. To walk with you. And do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hey, hey, let's do the benediction, get you guys out of here, okay? All right? I know, it's it's like there's two liturgical things we do, and that's we do candlelight service and a benediction. That's it. So, huh? I, well, I keep the Pope hat in the back. So, <laughs> all right, guys. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. His countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have a blessed day in the Lord. God bless you guys.